Hello, welcome. Hi, my name is David Hinkle. I'm your community manager on Civilization 6, and welcome to our Facebook Live Q&A. Uh, I'm here with the developers of Civilization 6. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. I'm Ed Beach. I'm the lead designer on Civilization 6. I'm Dennis Shirk, senior producer for the Civ team. Brian Basati, art director on Civilization 6. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, we solicited questions ahead of time from the community uh, via our Twitter pages and our Facebook pages, uh, which you can find at twitter.com slash civgame and facebook.com slash civ. But that last one you already know because you are here right now. Um, so let's just dive right into it, guys. Our first question comes from Douglas Taylor, who asks, how large can a city be? Um, I'm assuming he's asking how kind of wide, how many tiles wide can a city be, and is there some kind of population cap? Ed? Yep. Uh, happy to answer that. Um, you know, in terms of its width across the map, we're still doing the same thing we had with Civ 5. So three tiles out, that gives you 36 tiles to manipulate with that city. Uh, sometimes you do need a lot of those because we've got the new district system. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the districts go out around your city just like the wonders do now in Civ 6 and we have fewer improvements around the cities but overall the balance of how many tiles each city needs is, is about the same as Civ 5. Uh, so probably the more interesting thing to talk about is, is the population limit mm -hmm. and there is no strict limit on population but what you have to do with each city is you have to build up its housing okay. and housing comes from a lot of things. It comes from supplying fresh water to your citizens Lots of different buildings and districts in the game will supply housing, things like a barracks supplies a little bit of housing, granary does a little bit more, um, even a university where you're gonna have those co-eds going you know, and studying in your civilization. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they need a place to live, right? So they're gonna have to you know, have some housing allocated to them. So we've looked at all the sort of historical places where people live in cities and, and that's actually where housing comes from. Um, and you can get quite a bit of housing, uh, specifically with the, the districts that come online later in the game. So there's really no limit to it. Um, just housing alone is not going to keep your people ha happy, though. You're going to have to provide luxury resources and other types of what we call amenities. Mm -hmm. And so if you have lots of housing but no amenities, your people are going to be unhappy and just population growth isn't going to happen. So those are the two factors that go into building a large city. Uh, and it's important to build your population in a city because that determines how many districts you can have there. Districts are the keys to all sorts of things in the game, especially specializing your cities. So um, those things that, that I was just talking about, the housing and the amenities, are things you're going to be interested in and um, concerned with in each and every city in your empire. And uh, one thing that's particularly cool about that, I wanted to add on with uh, with what Ed was discussing there, is that there's no, also no longer any kind of presets. Like in Civ 5, if you were a culture player, you're probably going to have between you know, three to five cities that you had to go tall. It was just the way that you played. But because happiness is now local, and in terms of amenities and housing, you can actually be a wide player that's playing a really effective culture game. So you have those options. You're, you're no longer kind of bound by those same rules that you were playing in before. Um, the, other, the last thing to mention in terms of this, it, it's sort of a teaser for the end of this here, um, but we, we definitely have sieves that play with these housing formulas, and some there's certain sieves that are certainly really good at it. And uh, one thing that we wanted to do for people that hang on to the end of this broadcast is we want to um, kind of explain in more depth than we ever have before how the unique bonuses of a civilization are put together. Uh, so hang with us because we'll get to that at the end. Yeah, very good point. Thank you, Ed. Uh, make sure you keep watching all the way to the end because we have some brand new exclusive information that we're going to reveal here in this very uh, broadcast. So uh, great question, Douglas. Thank you very much for contributing that. Um, our next question comes from a fan named Street Guru uh, who asks, is there a new engine? Is Civilization VI built on a new engine? Uh, is it 64-bit or 32-bit? I guess, Dennis, this would be a good one for you, right? Yes. Um, it is built on a new engine. Uh, the render has been uh, just growing through time uh, from, from version to version to version. Um, we have a little bit of the render that we first introduced in Beyond Earth, but um, we've taken it to the nth degree. So we are 64-bit. We're using 
all the memories uh, now when we're coming in. And uh, Brian is definitely uh, taxing his art team to take advantage of every last bit that we have available to us. So yeah, it's um, it's really exciting. In terms of the rest of the new engine, um, Ed decided to, uh, to take out the trash too when it came to the game core. So they rewrote that from the ground up. They've got a whole new modifier system in place that lets them develop rapidly. Um, it's gonna be something that uh, Modder's gonna love further down the road when we start talking about that. But um, yeah, definitely exciting stuff when it comes to the new engine. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, the art, Brian's art team and um, what, you know, 64-bit kind of brings to the table. Brian, I mean, one of the, the awesomest things I think about Civilization VI, the first time I saw it, is that art style is so beautiful and it's so vibrant. Um, what does kind of a 64-bit engine afford you from an artist's perspective uh, that like a 32-bit engine or one of the previous game's engines, um, what, how are you limited by those where now this obviously, I would imagine, creates new uh, opportunities for you. Well, we have a lot more polygons to play with, so we can certainly uh, play up a lot of the silhouettes of the units and the buildings. Uh, we have much more elaborate shaders now. That they uh, they push the lighting a lot better. We have normal maps on all our characters, without getting too much technical detail. Uh, you know, the lighting can change in the world, and it's it still looks beautiful no matter what kind of lighting you put this unit in, because it's physically based. It has a more natural feel to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, great question, uh, Street Guru. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, Marcos Ramos, uh, who asks, will it be possible to destroy a city's specific buildings and surrounding uh, hexes, surrounding tiles? Um, I guess uh, Ed, this would be a great uh, topic for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, warfare is changing because of the unstacking of the cities. So now, rather than just that one target, which was your city center before, now there are all sorts of targets right. just within a single city. You can take out the science by hitting the campus. You can take out the industrial capacity of a city by hitting the industrial zone. Uh, the way this works is um, you don't destroy the building. You don't wipe that district off the map. Um, what you're doing is pillaging to mm. it. And pillaging can take, an, you know, each of those districts can take a number of hits from pillaging. Basically, mm -hmm. if you have all three of the buildings, um, present on that district by the time the invading army arrives you're going to have to knock out each of those buildings one at a time okay. with a separate pillage action that's pretty much going to be on a separate turn mm -hmm. um, so if you're camping outside a city you can really just just like historically when those sieges happened in like vienna in the 1600s those kind of it was besieged for you know, months and months and months by the Ottoman army and the whole area around the city was just wiped out. And mm -hmm. so if you if it can keep your army sort of squatting around that city for a long period of time, it's going to do tremendous damage to it. It's going to take quite a bit of time to rebuild it. Um, there is the option to raise a city, and so you actually can, if you capture the center, then go and wipe some things out permanently. Uh, but it, in general, if you're, like, just coming in and raiding the countryside around the city and not able to conquer the city... You'll do a lot of damage to it, but it, it can be rebuilt. Okay. I'm just going to let Brian chime in here, too, because uh, when you're talking about even just destroying uh, the districts or pillaging the districts, um, something that we never had to deal with in Civilization V is all the city buildings were just icon-based. They were just parked inside the city. Mm -hmm. So we never got to see or experience or have that, um, that terrifying thought of, oh, my God, our entire production district is now you know burning and, and, and wiped to the ground. But... Um, his art team has had to uh, get tasked with modeling every single thing in the entire game under construction, building effects, etc. The wonders, all their building states. And um, I could sit here talking for you, but I'll let you take that. <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, certainly adds to the complexity of the creating the art, but it's been well worth it. Uh, it's, it's great to, when you have a pillaged building to see smoke coming off of it, flames are, you know, coming up from the building. Um, it makes the world seem more alive, and that's one thing that we're trying to do with Civ is create a living world. So it's, it fits right in with that. And, and I think people, a lot of people have seen now the video that we're showing here at E3 with the gameplay footage, but we have a f segment there where Cleopatra brings her army in, and it just rampages through a bunch <laughs> of your districts and improvements, and you can kind of see exactly what we're talking about by looking at that video. Nice. 
And uh, if you're at E3, then, uh, you know, you can definitely check out that presentation. Um, I do, since we are doing this live, this is a live uh, uh, broadcast, I do want to give a shout out to Mark Zuckerberg, who just dropped a comment in our Facebook live video. Um, guys, you have a, uh, it's his favorite game, he said. So uh, let's all take a, yeah, don't screw up. <laughs> exactly. So uh, thank you, uh, Mark, Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, for stopping by. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's really awesome. And one of the things I, I really find interesting about the Unstacking Cities is the military implications, not only in early game, but also in mid game and late game. I mean, obviously, as you, you know, populate more of the map and create more diverse cities, um, when you're planning strategy for attacking your opponents, you can really kind of pinpoint and hit them where it hurts, um, not only on an individual city scale, but also planning in a, in a kind of wider picture. So um, that's, that's really exciting for me as somebody who's been a longtime Civ fan. So uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dennis? Just to comment to that, by the way, a whole other level that you have to this is even when you're passing by another city, you can see what they have. Before, you had no idea. You would have had to go in with you know, spies, et cetera, to actually see what's in there. But now you can identify things just by visuals. You know exactly what you're looking at. You know how the AI is specializing their cities just because you've got eyes on the city, which is much more real world to me, and it feels a lot more dynamic because of that. Yeah. It makes combat so much more interesting, too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Great, great question. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, we're going to move on. Our next question comes from Stardob, who asks, will there be movies when I complete the game and when I build wonders? Um, Brian, I guess this is a, a question for you. Sure. Uh, that's certainly something people missed in Civ Five, mm -hmm. and we wanted to address that. We have something really cool planned. I don't want to get into too much details, but there will be a reward for getting through such a long game and getting to the end, it won't just be a screen saying congratulations. And, and I think uh, we've been showing this in the videos. So I think yeah. people have an idea what's going on with the Wonder movies mm -hmm. um, because we're now showing, we've shown um, you know, Stonehenge and uh, the pyramids and the Great Library all being built. But mm -hmm. um, the really cool thing there is the time of day system that we have. And so I think Brian should, should elaborate on that at least yeah. a little bit. <coughs> Sure. Uh, since wonders take up their, their full hex now, and we get to make them very large, they, they actually feel like wonders now, uh, we wanted to make sure that there's something special for completing one of them. Uh, so we, we looked back at, at Civ 4, and we, we were inspired by the pre-rendered time of uh, time-lapse photography, where you have the sunrise and the sunset, and you see the building build up slowly, piece by piece. So we're doing that real time now. And so the backdrop of your wonder that that movie happening is your own city. Mm -hmm. And we can also change the time of day from sunrise to sunset, just like we did in, in the pre-rendered movies. Right. But also that time of day, we found other uses for it. Uh, it looks so cool that we've, we've talked about, or what we haven't talked about, we're implementing a looping time of day, mm -hmm. where if you want to play, you can, you can loop through a couple minutes of day to night cycles continuously through the game. It doesn't make sense to attach them to turn bases or turns because you know you're dealing with thousands of years. Yeah. But it, uh, it, the visuals are really pretty cool, and we're also giving the players the ability to change to a specific time of day. Mm -hmm. So if you prefer sunset or you prefer, you know, 6:45, uh, you you have that option to play the game at that that time of day. Thank you, sir. Um, and one thing I did want to mention about uh, the Wonder movies, um, wonderful vignettes. I uh, love them. We've actually shared one of the Oracle, uh, which you can check out on this Facebook page. Uh, we've also posted on our Twitter account. And then also uh, YouTube.com slash Civilization is our uh, official YouTube page. So uh, make sure you subscribe in all the places to see all the things. Uh, cool. All right. Um, so that was great. Thank you very much, Stardob. Uh, we're moving on to a question from Colin Kelly next, who asks, do some districts and or wonders increase yields of nearby tiles? So I guess, for example, if you build a district next to a hill, would it increase its production? Um, or is it more a case of, uh, you know, what's next to the district increases the potency of the district? Can you guys elaborate, like I said? Yeah, it actually, depending upon which specific district or improvement you're talking about, it can, can go both ways. Um, so some of the examples that we have um, talked about a little bit are the industrial zone. That gets a bonus for having mines and quarries adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not the mines and quarries that get more powerful. It's actually just the output of the industrial zone okay. that gets built up from that. Um, we also have things like 
wonders being adjacent to the theater, the culture district, yeah. that improves the output of the culture district. Uh, we have a lot of terrain-based um, adjacency bonuses. And actually, there's a bonus just for keeping your city compact, which means that just putting a district next to another district um, that can improve the, the output of all the districts that are interconnected. So just a cluster of districts like that is, is a good way to set up your city. If you, maybe, maybe the train's not there to give you the bonuses, it's still okay because you can just lay your districts out in a district pattern that's going to give you a bonus. Okay. So all sorts of different adjacency bonuses. It would seem sort of overwhelming to try to learn them all, but what we like about the system is a lot of them are sort of real world based and they make sense the commercial district you know having that right on the river where all the trade boats are coming in and out of your city that just feels right mm -hmm. and so we've actually found it's not too tricky for people to learn it if you do have trouble learning it when you're placing each district all the uh, modifiers just sort of pop up on screen and you like instantly see where they all are so you don't have to learn them if you don't want to but it is kind of good to learn them because then you can kind of just look across the landscape yeah. and uh, appreciate, wow, that's going to be a great place for my city. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I also wanted to add, um, you know, Brian, uh, obviously with so many different districts in the game, um, and when you're, you're playing a game, you need to be able to kind of at a glance understand what district is what. I mean, not only from a military perspective, if you're going to be a warmonger, um, but also just, you know, visual cues from real life, like you said. Um, so can you talk a bit about kind of, how real world scenarios inspired the look of certain districts or what you were really going for in terms of visual identity? Well, it's, first of all, it's great to actually be able to expand our city and, and create a sprawling city rather than combine them all in one single hex. Yeah, hex yeah. yeah. but we also, when creating the district, we looked at unique layouts for each of the districts. So they're not only visible by the buildings that go in them, but you can tell by looking at the color, you can tell by looking at the layouts where there's more square or radial pattern. So a lot of emphasis was put into the silhouettes of the, the buildings as you populate that, that district. Okay. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, wonderful question, uh, that was from Colin Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question comes from the Arquette sisters. Uh, I don't know if that's two people or one, but we thank you for your contribution. Uh, the Arquette sisters asks, uh, what new diplomacy features in Civilization VI separate it from past games? So can uh, I guess this is a question for you, Ed. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, we have a lot with diplomacy that's changed. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to have time to go into all of it, <laughs> but there probably three major principles um, that are governing what is different about the uh, diplomacy system, and I can hit on all those at least quickly. Uh, the, the first one is that diplomacy changes a lot over time. Okay. Uh, we actually decided to um, go as far as early in the game, even your borders of your empires don't work yet. You know, you know, you just haven't been able to kind of establish yourself as an empire yet. And okay. so you don't have to worry about open borders. You can just run across people's territories right from the very beginning of the game. It doesn't take long for that to kick in, and then you can have open borders agreements and mm -hmm. things like that. But you can tell that it, it's sort of like the wild, wild west right in the beginning of the game, and, and there's just not a lot going on in terms of formal diplomacy. You can still denounce people. You can still declare war on people. That kind of stuff is still available. Mm -hmm. But the, the formal elements, establishing embassies, all those kind of things, they come into play later. Now, we start to get very formal with the way diplomacy works once you get past the Renaissance. And we're not talking about that in detail yet, but we'll have a lot of information to share a little bit later um, in our uh, press cycle here where we'll go nuts with explaining how all the different diplomatic options work. So that's one thing, it's it changes over time. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that there is a ton of information available to you about what's going on in the world diplomatically, mm -hmm. but we're gonna make you work to under understand what that is that's happening. You're going to have to actively engage with the world, just like you do with our new technology boost system. You have to engage with the diplomacy system. So sending traders, sending diplomats, uh, sending delegations with gifts, uh, and later in the game sending spies, those kind of things, that's all going to increase the amount of information that you pick up on the other civs in the game. The more information you get, the higher level of detail understanding of what's going on in that civilization. You can find out, if you get to the higher levels, you know, 
what type of social policies that they're putting into their governments, what mm -hmm. government they have, what buildings they've built, what districts they're bringing online, where they're settling. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of information about what they're doing that's available if you dig for it. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the other, th that's the second thing is our mm -hmm. sort of, the, we call it the diplomatic visibility system. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that's very different about diplomacy is that every leader has um, multiple agendas which is sort of how they like to play the civilization game that might be different than the other leaders in the game. So they're not, all the AIs are not playing sort of the same way. They're gonna look at the diplomatic landscape in sort of with their own unique eye. Um, and the, the first agenda comes his, from the history of that empire. It's sort of what that leader was known for. Um, for instance, we have uh, Emperor Qin, who is the leader of the Chinese during uh, the period where they started the terracotta army and they started the uh, great wall of china and so he just loves building wonders mm -hmm. and that's his obsession and if you don't let him build more wonders than everybody else in the game he feels like you're just taking you know you're stepping on his territory yeah. on its turf and so he's going to get upset about that and that that's different than the other leaders in the game no one else is going to be quite that obsessed with it like that um, but that gives our character all of our leaders have a lot of character um, we actually introduce other agendas randomly, um, so they won't play the same way every game. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you spend time researching them with our diplomatic visibility system, you can find out what those agendas are. So the diplomatic landscape is very, very different in Civ Six from anything you've seen before. I just got to game this out a little bit because it's something that, that Ed mentioned. It's actually one of the uh, really cool aspects uh, in terms of the historical agendas and um, the player's ability to unlock ways to completely game the way that the AIs even interact with each other. Because he mentioned Chin's ability that he loves wonders, and if you start uh, having more wonders than him, he's gonna get very jealous, might go into a rage, might try to take a city from you, because um, he wants all the wonders. He wants to have the most wonders in the game. And then you have somebody like Teddy Roosevelt, who basically likes calmness on his continent. He doesn't like troublemakers on his continent at all. He's gonna be your friend if you're, you're maintaining the peace. Right. So you start thinking to yourself, if I'm a cultural player, I want the wonders, Chin wants the wonders, he's somewhere else, I'm here with Teddy. I start ramping up my wonder production. Chin gets mad at me. I keep doing it. Denounced. He declares war on me. Teddy's like, oh my god, what did he just do? And deteriorates his relationship with Chin. He goes to war with Chin. I now can go to war with Chin because he already declared war. I take Chin's cities. I get Chin's wonders. And I look awesome because I didn't do anything to up my warmongering score because I was declared on and I felt really smart for doing it because I caused all of this stuff to happen because I'm doing this master work of manipulating people. Those are the possibilities that can happen with these agendas. Once you actually peel back the surface and find out what makes these tick from game to game, there's a lot of fun to be had with this system. Sounds like you like Game of Thrones, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> He's like Tyrion over there. Tyrion. We'll just have to give him a new nickname. Yeah, and that's that complexity. Um, and, and players discovering that, I think, is going to be very, very exciting come October 21st when Civilization VI launches. Um, wonderful question. Thank you, the Arquette sisters. Uh, we're going to move on to Ivan2294, who asks, I noticed some coast tiles have cliffs on them in screenshots. Is this aesthetic, or will they affect gameplay? Um, Brian, I think this is a good one for you, right? Sure. Well, actually, both. Uh, they add some uh, visual interest to the train itself. Uh, if you look closely at it, you'll see the waves crashing up onto the the sides of the cliffs. Yeah. So, nice touch. Cool, thanks. And uh, also, they, they do have a gameplay feature. You cannot uh, embark from or disembark to a piece of terrain where there's a cliff in between. So you have to go around it. Okay. So it adds some uh, movement limitations okay. to the game. So yes, that's nearby where you want your city if you plan on defending from any kind of uh, coastal raiders or barbarians because you're up on that bluff. Right. You don't have to worry about melee ships coming in and you know tearing apart your city. It's, it's kind of nice. It adds a whole new element to the game. And as Brian said, they really look amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the, f the first time I think I saw uh, the Oracle Wonder movie and the waves crashing against the coast, Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, but are there any kind of uh, you know technologies or discoveries down the line that will change that for any player? Or? Uh, we're not going into a huge amount of detail here, okay. Um, okay. but there are ways you can get your combat units so that they can can actually surprise invade over over a cliff. Okay. So we'll, we'll go into detail on what that is later. Um, but yes, yeah, so it, it's sort of a, a fun element of game design that we sort of 
keep in, in our uh, bag of tricks at Braxis is we like these hard rules mm -hmm. and then we love to break them. <laughs> Um, and the, and that that's what's fun, especially you play a game and over and over again, oh, this ro ro rule's in place, I can't, oh, wow, they're letting me break it, you know, and that's just often one of the really fun times for players. Nice. Um, a lot of, lot of war-themed questions. Where are my culture players at, you know? Um, all right, great. Thank you very much, Ivan. And uh, we're going to move on to our last question here, uh, which comes from, and I'm probably going to butcher this, so I'm sorry, uh, Botas Hempfi, uh, who asks, Will the trade route system introduced in Brave New World return? Um, I know you guys have talked a little bit about trade routes in the past, um, but this is, I guess, a good opportunity to kind of reiterate the changes and what uh, kind of trade caravans bring now to the game. So I guess, Ed. Yeah. Okay, well, the trade system uh, is certainly inspired by what was done with mm -hmm. Brave New World. So you still have a capacity to the, uh, a limited number of trade routes. You build a trader units and then that unlocks the ability to choose okay i'm going to put in play this route for this given point uh, in time uh, between these cities and it's going to have a limited duration uh, so that's pretty much a carryover uh, but there are probably i'd say three new elements to that as well um, one is that your roads are built by your traders so that just feels like a nice nod to history uh, if you look at the way uh, trade routes developed in the ancient world, and they were all put in place where there was the need to get goods back and forth between um, cities, and so that's exactly how roads were built early in the game. Uh, we let you build them by hand later in the game once you unlock the military engineer, but initially having them set up by the traders makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. The um, second thing that the trade system has that's different is the time that a trade route stays in play is based on how long it is. Okay. Um, in, in Brave New World, it was more sort of a fixed amount of time. I think it was always 30 turns in most games. Um, but now what you can do is you can think about that, and maybe I need a road between my two um, nearest cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're going to want to put that in play, and maybe it doesn't give you as much you know, return. Maybe you're not getting as much gold from that as you normally would from another trade route. That's still good because because it's such a close proximity, you know that trade route's not gonna be taking too long for it to expire. So you'll get that trader unit back, you'll have that road connection in place that your units can use, and now you can maybe send it out to a foreign land. Mm -hmm. um, and then the um, other thing that we have with trade units is just like a lot of things in the game, every city is specialized by which districts it chooses to build. And that's how we compute what yield you get out of a trade route. It's not like all trade routes are just like X food and X production or X gold. Mm -hmm. it, it's all um, built up based on the districts that are Very present dynamic. in those cities. So yes, if, if you see a neighbor of yours, he's going playing really heavily science and he's got all sorts of science districts. If you're trading with him, you'll be getting, you know, s sucking in some of that science mm -hmm. from him. Um, but that could be culture, that could be religion, there, there are all sorts of things that could be based on what's happening around you. Very cool, very cool. Um, all right, interesting, great questions. Um, thank you very much to Mr. Mr. Hemphy, Hemphy. Uh, and I apologize for butchering your name. Um, but great questions from the community, thank you very much. But we promised you guys a little bit of uh, special info, exclusive info, and uh, I think, Ed, uh, you would be the best guy yeah, to reveal that. Do that as well. Okay, well, and we have been spending quite a bit of time watching the community reaction to all the rollout of information on Civ 6. So we sort of know what some of the burning questions they have, and we know our community loves to speculate on what Civs might come in the game and how they might be implemented in each of our games. Um, so the key fact that you need to be able to understand how a Civ is made up in Civ 6 is, like, how many unique bonuses does it get? And we haven't been very consistent about that. We haven't really explained that in any kind of detail, but I want to explain that now. So, uh, the, the most important piece of information is that there are four unique elements to every civilization. And just like in Civilization V, a civilization as a whole has a unique ability. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's typically something that maybe will last all throughout history. Mm -hmm. It's not you know, tied into a specific um, era. It's something that we, we kind of like you to be able to benefit from throughout the entire game. Uh, so we talked about um, for, for China, um, they have, um, well, actually, China, we, they have a, uh, where they, their builders get an extra charge. Mm -hmm. 
that is actually, um, and they can apply it to um, building wonders. Um, that's actually, uh, it hasn't been explained clearly, but that is actually something that only applies to ancient and classical era wonders. Okay. That's the only time they can use that charge. And since that's not an ability that spread, you know, spans throughout time, that's not a Civ um, ability. So China has another Civ ability. We're going to reveal that one soon, uh, not not today. Um, but because we have a limited time window thing, that's sort of like tied to Chin. And so that's the second thing that every civilization gets is they get a unique ability that's based around the time period of the leader. Okay. And so for China, it's help, it's that extra charge with the builder comes mm -hmm. with Chin, and then he can use those builders to build ancient and classical wonders just like he did in history. Um, so those are the first two uh, bonuses. Uh, because of the great modifier system that um, Dennis was talking about with our new game engine, we're able to hook up these, these bonuses faster than we were with Civ 5. So, mm -hmm. you know, adding two different unique abilities for every Civ, one that spans throughout time and is more civilization based, and one that's focused on leader ability hasn't been that, that difficult for us. Okay. Um, and then there are two other bonuses that every uh, civilization is going to get. One is a unique unit. Um, so, for instance, uh, with the Americans, we um, are announcing that the P-51 fighter Mustang, yep. Mustang is their unique unit. And that's going to confuse everyone right off the bat because we've said, well, they also have the, the Rough Rider, mm -hmm. you know, and you just I said that they have one unique okay. unit and how do they have two? Well, when you get to America, what we did is we looked at Teddy's, um, what, the, what we wanted to represent, you know, the, the Teddy time period bonus. Mm -hmm. And we were like... Well, that would be really cool if we had the Rough Riders because Teddy was actually the leader of the Rough Riders mm -hmm. when they charged up San Juan Hill. And so we said, well, let's take that leader era bonus and let's make it the Rough Rider a big part of that. And um, I think we're going to roll out some information about the full information about America soon within actually, the next. Actually, we already have it up. It's okay, so. Civilization.com. Yep. Um, <laughs> so the people will also know that, uh, that uh, there's a bonus. Um, with fighting on the American continent. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes also, that's the second part of Teddy's era bonus. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can have two unique units, but one will be a unique unit that's sort of tied to the leader's era. And mm -hmm. um, we'll, you'll see as, be, as we roll out the information on the different civilizations that there are a few of those that have that second unique unit that way. Okay, so that's three different bonuses. The fourth one is what we call unique infrastructure. And so that means that you're going to be able to get a unique building mm -hmm. or a unique improvement, very much the way a lot of the civilizations did in Civ 5. Not every civilization in Civ 5 had a unique building or an improvement. Mm -hmm. Some of them just had extra unique units. Right. But this time, you will get a unique piece of infrastructure so like, like the that. Film the film studio with America. The film studio with America is the perfect example of that. And we haven't revealed any of these yet. But there's a third possibility. You can have a unique building, you can have a unique improvement, or you can have a unique district. Mm, okay. So people have to wait to see what a unique district looks like. Um, but that's the, that's the third option for unique infrastructure, and uh, we've had a lot of fun with some of those as well. Awesome, awesome. Wow, a uh, lot of good info there. Thank you very much, Ed. And, um, you know, as we reveal more civilizations uh, g leading up to the launch on October 21st, um, you can find all that information at civilization.com. We'll also be revealing it on our social channels, uh, on our Twitter account, which is at civgame, or if you go to twitter.com slash C-I-V-G-A-M-E. Uh, also, this Facebook page you are on right now, hopefully, uh, which is facebook.com slash civ. Uh, but if you are watching the VOD on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash civilization, uh, make sure you go and like and subscribe and do all the social media things on all those channels. Um, but yeah, thank you guys very much. Uh, appreciate you doing this Facebook live Q and a here. Great questions from the fans. We're having a wonderful E3, uh, 2016 here in the Los Angeles convention center and, uh, look for more information on civilization six throughout the week and in the coming months as we lead up to launch. Um, have a great rest of the show, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining me. And thank you guys for watching and thank you guys for interacting and engaging with us. Um, you just, you make our world. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.